We're live on Zoom and also live on Facebook at this point. Good morning and welcome to uh, this event in the Irish American Crossroads Festival this morning. Um, this is actually the closing event of the Irish American Crossroads Festival 21. Um, and it is the launching event of Big Arts Weekend at the Old Church Center Cushion Dunn. Uh, what a remarkable year it has been for us. And um, I think for all of us, we can't be together physically this year in the festival, but it has been a year that has brought up new possibilities and the potential to forge new relationships. And this year we're privileged to partner with the Old Church Center Cushion Dunn in the launch of their festival, the big, their uh, big arts weekend um, at Old Church Center. So today we are um, being joined by uh, William Colvin, Katie English, and James Skivington to let us know, let us have a window into the history of the center, a little history of Cushion Dunn, um, and information about the launch of this uh, remarkable annual event in Cushion Dunn that we have the um, privilege to be part of in this way this year. So thank you all for this wonderful opportunity. I think Crossroads audiences are gonna be really interested in hearing about the events and also hearing about the um, potential to be present for each of these events as they, uh, as they happen this weekend. So good evening, everyone, or good morning to our transatlantic visitors. You're very, very welcome to the Old Church Centre in Cushendun on the northeast coast of Ireland, where we're delighted that you can join us at this time and, and partner up, as Margaret says. I'm William Colvin, and I'm chair of Cushendun Building Preservation Trust, and I've been a member of the group now for about 13 years. Cushendun Building Preservation Trust is made up of entirely of volunteers who give up their valuable time to ensure that this building that we're in was fully restored and is now being used to its maximum potential. We're fortunate to have two part-time members of staff. And you can see us on screen. This is where we're currently at at the minute. And um, the two part-time members of staff are vital in keeping the Old Church Centre alive. You'll be hearing more about the, the centre in due course. You join us this evening, as Margaret alluded to at our launch of our annual Big Arts Weekend, and we're excited to pick up the baton of festival, festivals from, from you guys over to us. Uh, so you're very welcome virtually, at least, to Cushendam. I'm going to talk more about the Big Arts Weekend towards the end of the, the webinar. And there'll also be an opportunity to ask us questions at the end. So if there's anything you hear us talking about, and, and want to know more about, please do ask that at the end. With me this evening, I have uh, my colleagues and more importantly friends, Katie English and James Skivington. Katie has been a member of the Building Preservation Trust since its conception in 2006, and we'll shortly talk about her experience of the old church as a, coming as a child on holidays and up to the present day, including how we transformed this once abandoned and derelict disused church into the modern community arts and heritage center we have today. James has been a member of our organization now for two years and has been invaluable and uh, bringing his skills to keep us running successfully. We're fortunate to have a strong team of volunteers and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them all for the work they put in throughout the years and some of them have moved on to other things and we're, 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 we wouldn't be where we are without our our strong team of volunteers. So I'm now going to pass the mic over to James and he's going to tell us a little about the village, its people and the rich history of culture, arts and heritage we have here in the Glens of Antrim. Thank you very much, William. Um, yes, Cushion Dunn. 
It's uh, from the Irish, meaning at the mouth of the river Dun, Dun being brown. And the reason it's brown is because we're uh, surrounded here by hills and mountains uh, on which it, um, lots of peat bog. And that's what colors the water and makes it a bit like uh, tea when it comes down the river. Um, perfectly clean and, and uh, you know, drinkable water, but it's colored by uh, the peat bogs up in the mountains. Um, it's a small village, uh, as um, William said, on the northeast Antrim coast. So if you're looking at the map of Ireland, it's the absolute top right hand corner. If you were to go around that corner, uh, we are on the Irish Sea here, but round that corner, you would be on to the Atlantic coast and the beaches are quite different. And indeed, uh, often remind me somewhat of the beaches of uh, Southern California with constant waves coming in a bit unlike the ones that we have here. Uh, we have a very nice beach here, a crescent beach, about half a mile long, uh, river at one coming in at one side. Um, uh, this is uh, part of what's called the Glens of Antrim. There are nine Glens of Antrim. Um, and the uh, Glen, for those that don't, of you that don't know, is a, a valley, basically. Uh, and they all mostly run down from the hills down to the sea. Some are small, one or two are really quite large. Um, we are about 52 or three miles north of Belfast. We are about 150 plus miles north of Dublin. And in the actual um, old church here, we are about 250 or 300 yards from the beach. Uh, so we're right on the coast. Uh, as I said, the Irish Sea. Um, at the river mouth or near the river mouth uh, is a harbor, which is quite small, uh, mainly used for um, uh, fishing and pleasure boating. Um, hundred plus years ago, it certainly had a significant commercial traffic with uh, Scotland, uh, cattle among other things. Uh, now it's purely, there's no commercial traffic at all. Um, and it is the nearest harbour to the UK mainland of any place in Ireland. Um, and that uh, terrain that that's across there is in fact Scotland. And you can see quite clearly various aspects of the Scottish hills with the naked eye from just a few hundred yards away. This is, uh, uh, well, it used to be a very remote region. It's not quite so remote now, but it is very rural. Uh, is actually a government designated area of outstanding natural beauty that was done quite a few years ago. And for those of you who have seen any of the photographs of the landscape or if you ever were here on holiday, you, can, you will see why that is very beautiful country. Um, the main occupations I think are agriculture. Uh, sheep farming is by far the major activity. And I think it's still the case, it certainly was a few years ago, that there were more sheep per hundred acres in the glens of Antrim than there was anywhere else in the whole of Europe. In addition to sheep farming, there is uh, certainly some cattle farming. And there was formerly quite a lot of activity in salmon fishing, that is fishing for wild salmon. But unfortunately over the years, the stocks of wild salmon for reasons yet unknown uh, has declined very considerably. They're doing research into that. They're also uh, feeding uh, small salmon uh, in at the head of some of the rivers in the hope that they will return in years to come and bring up the, uh, the stocks of uh, wild salmon again. A little way up the coast uh, in Red Bay, which is a large bay at the mouth of Glen Arif, another one of the glens, is salmon farming um, with salmon cages some few hundred yards off the coast. Um, another thing that's uh, a small uh, enterprise, but very successful in Red Bay is Red Bay Boats, who started off uh, building uh, pleasure boats, but over the years have uh, diversified and uh, now send some of the boats all over the world for the armed forces, fast retrieval boats and so forth. 
uh, and they've been they're all over they're in Malaysia they're in Australia they're all over the place so very successful and widely known in the boating community around the world of course with the landscape we've got and the various attractions which we'll come to in a moment this is a big holiday area uh, not so much uh, people staying in hotels were not that well served in the major area with hotels but very much uh, holiday homes for rental bed and breakfast that kind of thing um, and as well as the landscape and we like to think the very friendly people uh, we have uh, quite a few attractions uh, for example uh, about 20 miles away uh, bush mills whiskey distillery uh, the oldest whiskey distillery in the world founded in 1608 and still going strong uh, we all do our bit to try and uh, maintain bush mills <laughs> where we can. Uh, I believe it's a very popular whiskey in uh, the USA and in many other places around the world. Um, not far from the uh, whiskey distillery is a world famous and world heritage site, Giant's Causeway, which is a most unusual and remarkable rock formation over quite a wide area. And that uh, brings in many, many thousands of visitors every year. Um, a little further inland for uh, those of you of uh, sort of literary bent uh, is uh, just over the border into County Derry is the townland or the area of Belachy, uh, which was the home for our uh, Nobel laureate poet Seamus Heaney, whom uh, I'm sure uh, a few of you have heard about. Um, the other uh, notable thing about this which may ring a bell with some of you is that this area all around this coast and inland and in particular in Kushidun was used extensively for filming the Game of Thrones television series um, which was based up in Belfast 50 odd miles away at the Titanic Film Studios um, which has been very successful since its inauguration a few years ago. Um, and uh, it, we have a series of caves here in Kushindun, which are very interesting on their, uh, on their own merits. And they were specifically used in uh, at least twice, I think, the filmed in the caves in Kushindun for Game of Thrones. Um, finally, I would say the other distinctive thing about uh, this area, historically, I guess, uh, is that it, um, has been the, the destination or home for many writers and particularly poets over the years. Uh, one notable one of, from quite a few years ago was John Macefield, who was the uh, poet laureate, the UK poet laureate back in the day. Um, and many uh, painters, uh, primarily landscape painters, given the beauty of the landscape around here. So that's a, a flavor of cushion done. I would just also say that the, the climate here is generally mild. We do get quite a bit of rain, but we're served also by the Gulf Stream. So that keeps it quite mild. We don't really get much in the way of snow now and again. Uh, it can be wet uh, at times, of course, for all that rain that the USA sends over the Atlantic to us. Um, <laughs> But uh, generally speaking, it's a pretty mild climate, so never too hot, never too cold. Um, so that's a, a bit of a picture of the, uh, the area around Kushindun. Um, there are various websites that you can uh, look at uh, to find out a bit more. One I would recommend, which is very good, is the Glens of Antrim Historical Society. There are many, many photographs on it and some really good information over many years. So now I would like to hand over to uh, my colleague, Katie English, who will tell you something of the, the genesis of the old church and some of the many problems that primarily she, uh, as a prime motivator, has had to overcome over the last few years. Hello, everyone. Um, I, uh, as James has just said, I'm Katie English. I grew up in London, but my family have long historic links with Cush and Dunn. And so this was always where we came for summer holidays, for all our holidays. So actually it's basically, you know, it's the holidays one remembers. So it became my home 
very kind of firmly in my head. Um, as a child on holiday, one of the things that we had to do, I don't know that this is the case so much anymore, is we had to come to church. Not something you really want to do on your summer Sunday when there's a beach 500 yards away. But it wasn't all bad because one thing we had to walk through a field with a donkey in it, which was quite nice. And then we came down a little lane and just, just there's a wall which surrounds the church and a little stone style. And as a child, and I've almost everybody who was a child has, you know, who came to church remembers this. You had to go over the stile. You could not go through the gate and come into the church. It was just too pedestrian, I suppose. So going over the stile was exciting. And then, of course, then there was church. And I have to say, I can't remember much about the sermons. I'm sure they were very good. But I do remember this room here. There was a pulpit over there. And then there was a wee American organ, uh, like a harmonium, a pedal organ, just over in that corner too. And that was operated by a lady called Mrs. Bell, who pumped out hymns at an amazing pace and volume. Mrs. Bell was only about, well, she was probably under five foot. So she was very small and could hardly reach the pedals. So she was very vigorous activity and it made him singing a lot more fun, just having that kind of contraction going. So there we were, and that was quite a number of years ago and the church would have been quite full in those days, but during the time of the troubles and then with people moving away and you know the whole area kind of losing population, the congregation dwindled really severely. I mean, by kind of 2000, sometimes there'd only be four of us in the church. Uh, there were only services maybe once a month. And, you know, it was very obvious that the church was going to have to be closed. And there was a great kind of anxiety about the parishioners about what would become of it. At that stage, I didn't think that was anything I needed to be worrying about or my responsibility. But I do remember walking past it one day with a friend of mine, a composer, and he said, I was telling him about the problem and that the building might have to be demolished. Well, maybe not demolished because it was listed, but you know, we didn't know what was going to become of it. Nobody wanted to take it on. Uh, there was a risk of having the roof taken off so that it would be an ancient monument, which would mean uh, it got adopted, I think, by the Department of the Environment. And as we walked past, he said it would make a lovely little art centre. If only somebody would do something about it. And I, of course, ignored that remark for quite a long time, but I kept walking past the church and kind of started muttering this to other people. In 2003, the church was deconsecrated. And in 2006, we got together a group of a very cross community group of people got together and decided to set up the Cushendon Building Preservation Trust. Cushendon is traditionally quite a Catholic village. This is a Church of Ireland church. There's, it has always been totally cross community as a, as a village. And, you know, to, uh, everybody's very interconnected. So when, um, when we joined the, when we formed the committee, everybody was very keen to come on board. This is 2006 and we thought, right, what we need to do is we need to get some money. So we went to the Heritage Lottery Foundation, which is the big organization that funds projects like this. I remember going along, I had a little piece of A4 paper just like this. Um, we said, we've had this rather good idea. We want to turn our church into an arts and 
Heritage and Community Centre. We want to keep it open for the community. Uh, can you give us some money? And they said, well, you're not quite ready for us to give you some money. You need to do a business plan. We need to know more about your community. We need to know how this is going to work. Go away, work all these things out and come back when you're a bit more ready. Well, that was, I thought they were very, very unimaginative, I have to say at that point. I could not understand why they just didn't write the check there and then. Uh, but they didn't. But a very few weeks after that, and a very few weeks after we'd actually formed the uh, group, we were contacted by the BBC, who were making a programme called Restoration Village. It was a reality TV programme where different communities could pitch their heritage project uh, to the public on this TV programme. And the, one, the, the project that won the most votes would get the funding to, uh, for restoration. Well, we were invited to take part in that programme. And it was a bit of a flurry because we'd only just sort of got ourselves established, but it was fantastic. The whole village, which is very small. I mean, we've got a population of under a thousand in our ward, I think. So, you know, we were it was very hard to get a lot of votes out of a village that small, but our campaign was fantastic. And uh, everybody pitched in and we got campaigns out in Uganda and in Australia and the church was beautifully restored, sort of tidied and, and made to look lovely by everybody. And we won the, re the, Northern, the Northern Ireland heat. We didn't win the whole thing, so we didn't get the funding, but it certainly got us started. Uh, and it meant that we could go ahead and get a business plan and get a sort of uh, feasibility study and that sort of thing underway. So once again, I think I thought, well, that's great. Now that's the job done. We should be up and running in a couple of years. But uh, it wasn't that simple. First of all, we had to arrange the lease with the representative church body, which is the um, business, sort of property division of the old church. Of the, of the, sorry, Church of Ireland organization. And uh, then we had to get funding. We had to do a lot of fundraising. We had to get uh, plans done up and then get them through planning permission. And so actually the process from 2006 to 2016, it, there was 10 years of project development and hard work. In 2017, we finally were awarded our Heritage Lottery full grant. Uh, and was it 2017 or 18? 17. 17, I think it was. And then the work actually started, the restoration work started in 2018. I'm just gonna backtrack a little bit. I don't know if you can, you can probably see the church it's a very simple little building, hardly more than a barn, really. It's about uh, 40, is it 40 foot long by about 50, 18 foot wide? Uh, it's got beautiful windows with natural light and rather nice stained glass window at the back. It was built in 18, about between 1838 and 1840. Uh, in order to provide a place of worship for the Church of Ireland community, which had started to arrive in Cushendown when Cushendown became developed as a sea bathing resort. It's just having a bit of renaissance at the moment as a sea bathing resort. You have to be pretty hardy, but it, it's quite popular at the moment. The church was designed by uh, a local landowner and architect sort of property builder, developer called Michael Harrison, 
he lived over, I think, in Churchfield near Bally Castle. And uh, incidentally, he was one of the ancestors of Roger Casement. Uh, that family are very close, still there, a Bally Castle family, and um, the descendants have been very much involved and supportive of this project. Patrick Casement was one of our founder trustees. So there we are, 2018, the restoration started. It finished in 2019. We opened our doors with great fanfare. The photograph you saw was of our launch in July 2019, and we had great aspirations and a busy program for the future. But unfortunately, in March 2020, we just had to close again because of COVID. And then we've been kind of opening, closing, opening, closing over ever since. I'm going to really uh, now kind of wind up because William, who has also been involved for rather longer than I thought possible, is the man, he's our current chair, and he is the man who has a vision about what the center is about, and what it is doing, and our program of events. And also he is going to talk to you a bit about the Big Arts Weekend Festival. So over to you, William. Thanks, uh, Kitty and James. Yep, the uh, Cushion Dunn Big Arts Weekend, of which this is the launch event tonight, first came into being about nine years ago when one of our committee members asked, why don't we have a weekend where we can showcase the village and the vast array of uh, culture and heritage that we have here in the Glens. And that's basically where it started. We settled on the first spring public holiday weekend, which is the first weekend in May. Planning began and it was a huge success and one we've repeated every year since, with exception to last year where most things ceased to exist. However, one thing we have learned from the pandemic is that we are a resilient bunch of people and we've adapted to the Zoom culture like everyone else and used it regularly in the day-to-day -day running of the centre and we've taught ourselves how to live stream and, and link up to events such as this. Throughout March and early April this year, we recorded a, a bunch of local musicians, storytellers and writers and streamed it out to our Facebook and website to test the appetite for such content. The feedback and the number of views we received is absolutely incredible with us now reaching over 20,000 views on some seven or eight 20 minute video clips. So you can imagine for a, a 90 seat venue, such as our own in the middle of the rural Northern Irish countryside, we're amazed, amazed to, is it really an understatement? Uh, and living in a rural and sometimes isolated area like this, there's often a feeling of why would anybody be interested in what we're doing or what's happening here? But with the number of virtual visitors we've had to cushion down the old church in the last couple of months, we now know different and that's going to inform a bit of change in how we do things going forward and maybe any events we're having here have them as a hybrid event where the audience can be global in nature, which is kind of hard to, yeah. hard to fathom that. It's, it's a very strange one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so bringing it back to this year's festival, as we say, tonight is the launch and after this event at 8 p.m. UK time, or I think it's noon on the Pacific coast, we have a wonderful performance by Joan McCready, a one-woman play, Cool Lady, and Joan is currently living in Baltimore and is very kindly contributing remotely to appear live here in Cushendon this evening. So you can imagine how excited we are now to have two transatlantic events in the one night. Tomorrow afternoon, we have our much-loved Share a Poem event, and this is usually held in the very historic Cushendon Hotel. But however, due to the current restrictions, we're making this event virtual also. But it has allowed us to expand our readers and participants. And we're fortunate to have two highly regarded poets from the area reading their own work, Damien Gorman and Elaine Gaston, as well as many other local people reading poetry that's special to them. 
I'll share a poem maybe in the middle of the night for any of you guys uh, watching, but for it and any of our events, if you register on our website, the oldchurchcenter.com, you'll receive a link and that will stay live for two weeks. So if you're not able to watch it there and then, it's once you've got the link, it's, it's good for two weeks to watch on demand. After Share a Poem, we're switching into one of our live events, which is uh, a conversation with Bernie McGill, who's a, an award-winning novelist and short story writer. It's going to be broadcast from here, much like we're doing this evening over Zoom. Uh, it's an event with requiring a bit of audience participation. So she's going to be talking about her work and then we'll be opening the floors to questions. To round off Saturday, we have two wonderful performances that I'm looking forward to. The first being the premiere of a short movie that was written and starred by a, a local actor in the village here, Julie Kinsella. And she's, to say, written and starred in it, which is a funny and touching memoir of the, her, her mother's life. So it's the wit and wisdom of my mother tomorrow. And tomorrow evening, it's a lovely little event where a trio of tunes and tales with Colin Irwin, Stephen O'Hara and the Mulholland family are going to take us on a mystical journey throughout the glens of Antrim and beyond with uh, a spellbinding compilation of spoken word and traditional Irish music. So there's a good many events tomorrow. Sunday has traditionally been, and this year is no different, a family day, virtually, uh, beginning with Little Folk Online, which is a, a Zoom workshop for kids and all the family. And of course, our now world famous sandcastle competition, which one year nearly turned into a snowman building competition, is but a particularly <laughs> late snow. And uh, we have a local sand sculptorist, Andrew Gilf Gifford, and he's recorded uh, a how to video. And we've been able to place that up on our video. So he's made some fantastic sculptures locally. So he's going to come and judge the, the sand castles on Sunday for us. And the final of the kids event is another Zoom one. We have a magician, Steve Price, and he's going to bring a little magic to our day through his interactive online magic show. And I'm looking forward to that too. So many brilliant things. We're also excited to be joined by Leslie Travers. Leslie is an internationally acclaimed set and costume designer, and he's going to be down here um, sharing his creative journey for bringing the opera Francesca de Rimini at the Teatro Alla Scala Theatre in Milan. So he's going to be talking to us tomorrow, our Sunday afternoon, about how he brought that to be. And rounding off the evening, we have a local band, Runabay. Uh, who are an absolutely outstanding group with great harmonies and melodies. And they've attracted a huge following, not only locally, but on a, a global stage as well. So we've got some good tracks for them. Monday is the bank holiday here, the public holiday for us. So we can afford to take that extra day to be able to fill it with some events as well. And that's our, our last two events. We have a, a conversation with Raymond Watson in the afternoon. Raymond is a visual artist. And he talks about his art and audiovisual installations that he's done and the projects that he's been involved with. And last, by no means least, we're delighted to welcome back to the Big Arts Weekend, who usually close off the, the weekend for us as the Lurig Drama Group. And uh, they're going to have a four-person performance of Is This Seek Taken? It's an award-winning one-act comedy, and it's going to be a perfect way to round off the weekend. But as I mentioned at the beginning of my piece, it was originally designed to showcase what was possible if we had a multi-purpose venue to be able to stretch these things out over the, the place of a year. And in year on year, it's gotten bigger and better. And I think you'll all agree that uh, even with the restrictions in place, our program this year shouldn't, shouldn't disappoint. And we would be delighted if any of you would like to come along and join us for some of the events. And you can do so by visiting our website, which is theoldchurchcenter.com. And uh, right up there at the top, there's a, a banner for Big Arts Weekend 21. And that has the full list of activities there. So even if once the events take place over the weekend, it's going to remain up there for two weeks where you can still dip in and take a look. We really are looking forward to be able to bring visitors back into the centre again soon, safely, of course. And the hall has been far too quiet over the last year and it's it's been really heartwarming over the last number of months when we've been recording these pieces which have been going out. I've been very fortunate. I've been having little private concerts 
to myself, which I've been able to share online. But the last 12 to 14 months have been incredibly difficult for us, not only financially, but our morale has taken a hit too. As you heard from Katie, it was some 14 plus years to get the building to the this condition that it is in now and to have to close within six months of our really high energy launch and building of, of, of activities, it was really demoralizing. But we're entirely funded by any events that we host and we've been jealous, generous, generously awarded funding through the National Lottery Heritage Fund and local council as well as other, other funders to be able to complete the restoration. But ongoing costs are, can be difficult as you imagine and the National Lottery Heritage Fund again stepped in to, to cover part of our core costs. But we're very thankful to our regular monthly supporters uh, who donate some money to us each month from as little as three pounds or four dollars a month. You can help keep this wonderful venue functioning and help secure it and its place in the landscape of the County Antrim countryside. And again, details on, on that and more information about detailed information about the centre and the area can be found on our website. We're going to be launching a new website over the next month or two, so keep an eye out for that as well. But the link will be the same as it currently is, and that's theoldchurchcentre.com, where I'd encourage you all to take a look. So looking forward and with the huge success of our online events over the last 10 weeks or so, as I said, we are looking to continue with a hybrid style of event management and production with an audience in the centre and further afield online. So I'm going to stop talking now and uh, thanks for inviting us to take part in your festival. And um, I don't know if anybody has any questions or wants to, to comment, uh, you'd be very welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to, to all three of you for this great introduction and overview of the history and of the place and the building and the festival itself. Um, I've gone ahead and uh, copied in the website there for folks um, to have a listen to uh, or to have a look at. Um, so absolutely. Uh, I think it's 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 a great investment of your time to become familiar with everything on the website. William, I was wondering if I could switch over to the website for just a minute here and um, show people around a little bit to it's crazy. places that might be of interest to them. Um, if you want to direct me, that would be great to to what what you think would be most sure. Uh, the, the big thing, of course, uh, uh, the banner at the top there, you can find information. We have a weekly um, Tai Chi class, which is very popular. There's a guy down here and he hosts the class from here and his audience is most of it. Uh, well, a good proportion of his audience is actually coming in across the water in England. So that, that's you can join up to that. But as you can see further on down that page you've got there is the all of the events that we have happening this weekend, let's say beginning in about just over an hour's time and uh, you're, you'd be very welcome to register for any of these. So even the likes of Cool Lady, which is just coming up in the next hour or so, if you don't have to sit down and watch it now. Once you go in and register your place, it will be staying up online for the next two weeks. So it's uh, available to watch and you can very simply follow through those links. It should be a straightforward process and an email will arrive in your inbox with instructions on how to watch it but right up across the top of the the website there um, is just a, a little bit more detailed information if you go into there live from the old church um, button those are the the little events i've been talking about over the last six or weeks or so so these are all local musicians and you'll you'll see james in it as you go down he has read one of the short stories he's written and uh, they're all available online and that archive goes back many years now there's been a, yes. a, a lot of youth projects that we've been involved in getting um is the different uh, dance hall it is yeah that. that's dance a lovely that. uh oh, sorry uh one of the projects we did what before we actually had the building but we were trying to 
kind of show people or engage people in kind of heritage and creative projects as a sort of taster of what could happen in this building. And one of the projects which I'm particularly fond of was a project called The Dance Hall from Castle Green. It's a film made by our local, local youth council, the youth groups, I think there were about a dozen teenagers involved, and they uh, interviewed people who had been, who lived through the tight days of the 1950s and 60s dance halls. There was a dance hall about a mile outside the village you would go past it now, it's still there, and it's in the mid, just on a crossroads. It must have probably been an old crossroads where dancing took place, maybe, you know, traditionally. But you'd never think of it as being this kind of hub of activity. But in the 50s and 60s, that dance hall would attract people from all over Northern Ireland. And so the teenagers kind of got interviews and footage, and it's a lovely film which talks, it gives you a little insight into our community and our history. Um, there's lots of other films on there too, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hand, oh, just one thing, there's quite a good history of the old church up on the yes, website, yes, I yes. think, at the top page. I'll hand you back to William. Yeah, and across the top panel there, I think there's a, the, the, you're in it now, the history button there, and that's a very detailed yes. uh, history of the, the building and the, the families around here that would have used the building in its, in its heyday. Awesome. And um, one thing I just wanted to uh, ask your help in uh, pointing people to is how to support you. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Project. And so. uh, yep, if you drop in there, um, you, you can the like, financial support is always good. But like, even having content like this, where if you have a, a project or an idea that you think we could do collaboratively, remotely, um, we would be delighted to to get in touch. And I would encourage anybody to click that button there to join the mailing list and that and pop your I'm, email that address. I have to fly out to California to reach all this. <laughs> Um, but you can join the, the mailing list there, and then you get a little email every time we're, we're doing something that, that may be of interest. And, um, and more for our more local viewers there this evening, there's information about how you can come along and, and help out even just to... We open as a visitor centre at the weekend, and it's really nice to just come and sit in the space and, and speak to our visitors. So if there's anybody locally that would be interested in coming down to be a, one of our welcome hosts, we would, we would love to hear from you. And, um, All the way from California. Californians are also <laughs> very welcome. <laughs> so thank you very much. Well, um, James, I think that personally, from the California perspective, this idea that the beach at Cushendon is similar to beaches in Southern California is <laughs> fascinating. And, and, well, and not, not so much the beach in Cushion Dunn, but up around the corner to the Atlantic coast, uh, there are some really big beaches, much bigger than here. And they, they do very much remind me, having driven up Highway 1 from Los Angeles to California, uh, you know, well, you, you'll know what the beaches are like with the constant waves coming in. And that's very similar to the North Coast here. And that is uh, because of the... Uh, the the Atlantic Ocean coming in here. So, yeah. Uh, and indeed, if you're talking about California, the road from here, which is the Antrim Coast Road, uh, is has often been um, compared in a much smaller form to Highway 1 coming up, uh, in, in certainly in Southern California and up to Big Sur and up all around that way. It's very similar in many respects, very dramatic, rocky coast. So... Yes, mini California in County Antrim. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Katie, I have a, a question for you from my vantage point here. I can just see the outline of the stained glass windows at the, what I think is the back of the church. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering um, what design are those or um, if you have any- We any don't have a very detailed history of them. 
but we think they were uh, commissioned or given to the church when it was built, or possibly subsequently, by the O'Neills of uh, the Antrim O'Neills from Shane's Castle. They, there are two panels on the two side panels that uh, have the O'Neill coat of arms. And those panels are thought to slightly predate the church. So it may be that they were kind of designed to accommodate those two bits of glass. And then the rest of the windows are kind of high Victorian, so Irish stained glass. They're very pretty. You can't, the light isn't coming through them very well at the moment, but there's some good, I think there's a good photograph of them on the web, website. There used to be in the middle a uh, bit of stained glass, which had the red hand of Ulster, but that, but those windows used to be external and it did attract a certain amount of attention and, and that got broken. And so, uh, when they were restored, those pieces, we'd, we'd lost those pieces, it had just got smashed. But we've got the O'Neill uh, coat of arms still. That's, uh, that's something that maybe we should have mentioned for maybe of interest to your sort of viewers about some of the surnames from around here. Katie has mentioned O'Neill, there's O'Neills, McNeills, O'Hara's, uh, McQuillan's, um, McDonald's, who have been a way back Scottish connection. And indeed, we even have at least one McPeak family here. We do. <laughs> we do, just up the road. <laughs> We're everywhere. What can I tell you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yes, that would be because obviously the, the Irish Americans clearly look back to Ireland to see where their uh, forebears come from. Uh, and it's always fascinating to hear about surnames and, you know, where they come from too. So, yeah, that may be of some interest. Perhaps we can, when we do something else like this again, we'll do a bit more research and come up with a few other names and a bit more of history. We are being so near Scotland here, there's been, a, it used to be one uh, kingdom actually, Dalriada was called way many, many hundreds of years ago, um, because it was very difficult to go inland because of the mountains before the roads were properly built. So it was much easier to go by sea over to Scotland and they traded in cattle and other things. Um, so there's a, quite a few Scottish names here um, from a long time ago. So there we are. So really fascinating, James. Thank you so much. And thanks to all three of you. And I look forward to, you know, I hope that this is the beginning of a relationship. Absolutely. With our Absolutely. Organizations. And um, I personally am really looking forward to um, being part of the festival from here virtually. Um, and I'm also conscious that you are about an hour away from launching. <laughs> yeah. so I, I want to uh, respect your time and um, thank you profusely for this uh, opportunity to, to feature your work um, and, um, and also to invite the audience that's listening to go to your website, go to your social media pages and uh, take part in what, what promises to be a really wonderful event. So best of luck to you uh, at the beginning thank you. of this weekend. And thank you again, all three, so much. Yeah, thank you. It's thank been you really lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Adam, Come lovely. and see us for real one day. I can't, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Bye for now. <laughs>